Hello and welcome to the Katie Halper Show. So excited to be here with you. Today's show is going to be really important and really informative. We have a an amazing, amazing lineup of guests. First, I'm going to be talking to Miko Peled, the author of The General Son. Then I'm going to be talking to Mohammed Hissam, who is an organizer, um, a Palestinian-American organizer. And then we're going to be talking to... Norman Finkelstein. So before we start, please do what you always do, hopefully, which is like the stream. It's really important for us to get the stream out there because I think the we can, would all agree that these are going to be important perspectives that most places are not uh, streaming. Uh, obviously, if you've paid any attention to the media or social media, there's quite an uh, obvious bias that we're seeing. And these guests are going to debunk that narrative. So please do not just like and subscribe and to subscribe, you hit subscribe and then the bell, but also share this now on social media so that people come and watch it. Um, also, if you can join the Patreon, patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And um, that way you get extended interviews. Some of this may be Patreon only. Um, I'll know by the end of the stream. Uh, so if you're watching this later and there's anything that's Patreon only. The place you find that again is patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Um, alrighty. So without any further ado, I'm going to bring on our first guest. Uh, he's been on the show a bunch. Uh, Miko Pellet. He's an Israeli American activist, speaker, and writer. He's the author of The General Son Journey of an Israeli in Palestine and Injustice, the Story of the Holy Land Foundation. And you can also find him at Patreon and you can find him at MikoPella.com. Welcome, Miko. Thanks, Katie. Good to be with you again. Yes, of course. Thank you for joining. Uh, it's obviously not a very uh, happy time right now. Um, we are going to be talking about the situation in Gaza. But I thought that before you talked about that, uh, I think it's important for people to know your story. And could you just kind of give a brief overview of the family that you come from, your political trajectory, and the um, the hardships that your family has dealt with? Sure. Well, thanks for having me on the show again. Um, so I just want to say I just came from a really uh, wonderful event here in D.C. at Bus Boys and Poets, which was kind of an open mic where just people, not necessarily the usual people, but some people who are not the usual crowd came in and uh, came out and kind of spoke from the heart about what's happening, how they see it, what their thoughts are. And it was really very, very moving. So it's something that uh, I strongly recommend, just kind of a, you know, a place to get together and just talk as opposed to receive information or argue or express opinions, just to kind of speak from the heart. It was very, it was very helpful. It was very good. Um, well, like you said, I, I, I'm, you know, I was born and raised in in uh, in a very Zionist family in Jerusalem. My family is still there. Maybe I'll pop back and forth. I mean, I've had family in Kibbutz Beri, which is one of the kibbutzim that was very heavily hit by the Palestinian fighters. Um, what I heard, I was talking to my sister this morning. It's completely wiped out. And my cousin and her husband, um, who are in their seventies now, are were one of the last ones who somehow well, their home was not uh hurt and they were only um evacuated today so they've been there seven eight nine ten for three days hiding in their home quietly trying to figure out how to you know play with a lock so nobody can unlock and come in and as fighting was going on outside and um another kibbutz where i have family kibbutz zikib also right in, just just on the border with gaza just north of gaza there's been fighting there and lots of other places in that area so you know, my family back there are, everybody's terrified, I have to say. Not only my family, Israelis are terrified. They've never seen anything like this before. And, you know, it, it puts me and them once again in a in a difficult situation because my stance, even though I come from this very Zionist family with a father who was a general and so on. And your grandfather you know, was a signatory to Israeli independence. Right. My grandfather signed the general, the uh, 
Israeli um, Declaration of Independence. So he was an important Zionist uh, leader. And, you know, my entire family, come, you know, are part of that, you know, Zionist uh, leadership that established and then ran the state for for first few decades. Um, but I, I, I was saying today in this open mic thing, you know, I, I don't stand in solidarity with Palestinians. I don't support the Palestinian cause. I see myself as part of the struggle, as part of the cause. I'm not separate from it and expressing solidarity. And uh, when my family's over there going through this, people are afraid to leave the house. They don't know what's going on. The army's collapsed. The police has collapsed. The, the, everything they relied on or they used to rely on has collapsed. In other words, there's nobody protecting people. And that's a very scary place to be. And the children are afraid and, you know, and, um, and here I am, you know, making these very bold statements in support of the Palestinians and the Palestinian resistance. So it put us all in a, in a, in a strange, uh, or somewhat strained, um, kind of situation. I did speak to my, like I said, I spoke to my sister this morning at length and kind of to learn where they're standing and what's going on because the news we get here and even the news they get there is, um, is, is incomplete because nobody has the full picture. Israelis are, do not know what's going on. The Israeli government doesn't say anything. The military has, as far as anybody can see, fallen apart. It's mostly groups of guys who are reservists who just put on their uniform, grab a gun, and go with their buddies to fight somewhere, you know? And so they're in a very difficult position. And uh, like I said, here I am, you know, standing here with either a kofia or a Palestinian flag speaking in support of the Palestinian or as part of the Palestinian struggle. Um, and, you know, so this is one part of what my family is going through. And I was thinking today, you know, as you know, I have two young children. They're half of their, grand, they have grandparents and uncles and aunts who are Palestinians, and they have grands, grandparents and aunts and uncles who are Israeli, and they never met. And it's not because they're in Gaza or the West Bank. They live an hour drive within, you know, on, on, on the main highway, but they never met, and it's likely that they never will at least not in the near future. So this is kind of a unique situation that I'm, a unique position that I'm in and eventually they're going to be in. And um, we had another you know, unique experience, a tragedy when 1997, um, my sister's little girl was killed in a suicide bombing. And so that also put our family in this uh, strange, a very different space because we were a family that came from Kind of very liberal Zionist supporting the two-state solution. My father, after he retired, you know, pushed very hard for negotiations with with the Palestinians for the two-state solution, for a Palestinian state, for Palestinian rights within that framework. He even met with Yasser Arafat, and so and then suddenly, you know, his granddaughter was killed by Palestinians. I mean, boom! I mean, it just kind of shows you this this uh, very bizarre reality that exists there. And how are you just kind of thrown into this reality, regardless of, you know, you just happen to have been born to this to this reality. Um, so the strangeness or the uniqueness, I should say, of, of my situation, my position in this in this story um, it comes to light every so often. There's something that brings it up to the surface and I have to stop for a minute and realize, wow, you know, I haven't spoken to my family since the attack on October the 7th until this morning because it's a little bit strange you know um so anyway that's kind of the that's the background of of where i you know where, where i come from and where i am today and and the sister you spoke to is this the sister who had whose daughter was killed? no i spoke to a my sister, sister. I, have, I have two sisters yeah i spoke okay. to another sister and, and on top of all this your know, kassam rockets are falling everywhere as far north as tel aviv airport and my family's in jerusalem so that's further south and in the north the rockets are coming in from Lebanon now, pretty hard, pretty, you know, obviously pretty in, with, with quite a bit of intensity. And so is people don't know where to go. And there's this sense now the, 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 the part of the fence that separates Gaza from the rest of the country has been, you know, torn. It was basically barbed wire and it's still open. So the fighters are getting reinforcements and they quite freely go back and forth apparently. And nobody knows how many are in there, how, how many are around. Nobody knows if they've got, if they're driving around freely on the highways, if someone's going to show up in your neighborhood with, you know, if a, you know, a group of, of fighters is going to show up in your neighborhood and did what they didn't do and start shooting like they did in Sderot and Tivot and some of these other 
cities and some of the kibbutzim in the south. So the fear and the, the, the terror is real. I mean, people are feeling terrorized and are feeling very, very scared. And on top of that, there's rumors of beheadings and rape and because there are all these networks out there that are putting up out all the stuff. And according to what I understand, the only, the only reliable source of information is coming out of Gaza somehow. Uh, because the Israeli government is not providing any information to the citizens, and the Israeli news are, you know, they what they see is what they can they can um, is what they can broadcast, and they don't see a lot. I mean, what they happen to see as they're driving down, or what they whatever you know bits of information they get in the studio. So Israelis have never been in a situation where every single agency that was supposed to protect them collapsed. I mean, all the redundancies that are supposed to have existed and were prevented this collapsed very quickly. I mean, they were challenged and they were gone. I mean, you see the ease with which the Palestinian fighters came in. They with gliders and and on foot. And then they took an entire military base with tanks and they took a general POW and the, ta the base is now theirs. The base does not exist. And this is the main base the Gaza Brigade base, which is supposed to protect those, you know, those settlements that are on the outside, on the outskirts of Gaza. So Israelis have never been in this in this situation where everything collapsed. They're always afraid of this. There's always this fear, you know, God forbid that, you know, we should, you know, we should put our guns down or God forbid we should, we wouldn't be, you know, as diligent as we should be. They will come and they will slaughter us all. You know, this is kind of this, the, uh, well, when the, they were tested, and they were tested twice. I mean, they were tested exactly 50 years ago when the Egyptian and Syrian army attacked in 1973. It wasn't as bad as this. It's not like there were soldiers running around the streets and shooting in cities. And uh, the entire system collapsed. And now the entire system collapsed even more so. Um, I mean, there was no intelligence. And Israel is supposed to have this great intelligence system and all these units and all this information and all this, you know, cyber stuff and, and 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 god knows what else uh and human human information too i mean every other person is a collaborator i mean you can't talk you can't sneeze okay. in one part of palestine without somebody talking about it five minutes later in another part of palestine and this entire operation was planned had to be months to plan something like this the equipment had to be purchased or built the soldiers the fighters had to be trained I mean, they executed this like a very well-trained, well-disciplined military force. So they had to be trained. They had to practice somewhere. They couldn't have done all of it in tunnels under the ground. And nobody, nobody saw it coming. Nobody had, you know. And so Israelis are going. And then the military, the army wasn't there when they came in. They walked right into a military base. They walked right into these kibbutzim. They walked right into these big cities. So what and happened? Why was there this know, failure? Nobody has the answers. And, and, and the attitude right now in the press is, well, we'll get to that later. Now we just need to make sure everybody's safe and we know what's going on. We'll get to the blaming and to the investigating later. But more and more and more you sense, and I see this in the Israeli press, you know, the, the, the bits, the talk about what the hell happened go from the very bottom. They go up and up and up. They're not in the front. They're not in the top headline yet because they're still saying, let's let's wait with that. Um, but let's say they do find out that there was, you know, so what? So there, this one general will be fired, another general will be fired. The, the, the government, there is no opposition. So it's like Israelis can go to the polls tomorrow and vote for somebody else, because they're all scrambling to be in, an, in a national unity government, which means both sides. Imagine the Republicans and the Democrats bo are both in the White House. I mean, it's a parliamentary system, so it's different. But you know what I mean? Are both in the executive branch, and uh, and and that's what they want to do now. So so all the parties are going to be in the government, which means there's even there's no opposition. Even symbolically, there's no opposition. So who do you vote for? And besides, the entire Israeli political system is in musical chairs. The guy that was Minister of Defense yesterday is going to be back again as Minister of something else tomorrow. And, you know, all this musical chair goes on. And the head of this monster, which is Netanyahu, doesn't change because nobody can challenge him. 
So Israelis mm-hmm. don't even have a choice. Let's say they do find out that this was, I mean, they, they know, everybody knows that this was a massive failure of every system possible. But this can't be blamed on some, you know, on some general or on some officer. This is systemic. This goes all the way to the top. And in a real democracy, the person at the top will have would have had to quit his job, but that's not going to happen here. And what about the the claim that uh, Egypt had warned them? Yeah, that claim is out there. I mean, that's what they're saying. They're saying now that Egypt warned them, uh, which is really it's supposed to do, because that's what Egypt's role is in, in this triangular relationship between Egypt, Israel, and the United States in regards to Gaza. Uh, and then they're saying that there were other warning signs coming out of Gaza, that there were some intelligence people that were warning, saying that this was coming or that they so no notice that there was training. I had a gut feeling that something had to happen. I mean, I was feeling the last couple of weeks thinking, this is awfully quiet. I mean, this is really awfully quiet, the Palestinians, because there was this eruption of activity in Nablus and Janine a few months ago. And then just this complete silence. And I felt like this doesn't feel right. Something is, doesn't seem right. And boom, we woke up on the 7th and, and heard that this has been going on. Um, how the intelligence services didn't, how this didn't go up the chain of command, how this wasn't noticed. It's going to be investigated, but it's not going to lead to anything significant, like I said, either way. Yeah. And I just wanted to add that, you know, something that was so amazing about your story, and I really recommend that everyone read uh, The General Son, was how it was in some ways the killing of your niece that radicalized you. Yes. Well, and made you, yeah. 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 I mean, so, I mean, you, you you don't know how to respond when something, nobody knows how to respond when something like this happens, but the one thing that it does is it shakes you up to a point where something changes, you know, it's a kind of uh, shock that just changes everything. And so, uh, you know, I really have to thank my sister who stood up and said, first of all, don't talk to me about revenge and retaliation and killing more people. And number two, for pointing the finger at the Israeli government and saying, well, you treat people like this, this is the result. So you're, it's, it's Israel is Israel's to blame. And I think it's, it's relevant today, too. This is exactly what is happening today, too. I mean, you keep people treated like this, you're going to get, this is, the, this is what you're going to get. And then that started my brain, kind of gave me, I think, a direction to go in. And then I uh, began you know, to engage and, and meet Palestinians and, and, and so on. And you know this idea. We 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 very often you know this the violence in Palestine has been completely normalized. Okay, so three people blew themselves up. There was a suicide bombing. There were five people injured. Blah blah. blah. Wait wait a minute. What? Three young people. We never stopped for a moment and paused to take it in and let it sink in. Three young men blew themselves up and killed a whole bunch of other young innocent people with them. What are, what is going on here? This how do, how can we go on beyond that and talk about anything else? We need to stop right there and say, wait a minute. Say that again. Who are these people? Where do they come from? What is the what is the larger story here? You know, we're not talking about you know just you know something that's out of the blue we're talking about there's context here there's a political context here that we can't ignore and then we have to de- dig deep into it. and that's what i did i chose to dig into it and you know i came out you know radicalized and 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 i suppose and 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 with the opinions and the decisions that i made about my life and my and my and my work and what is this story, the context that so much of the media is leaving out? Because you see these people who it's very I find this very hard to to deal with right now because um, people really think that they're just when they express sympathy um, towards the Israelis who have been killed. They don't think that they need to mention the Palestinians who have been killed or they don't think that they need to mention what um, Netanyahu is responding with, or they don't feel that they need to mention how Israel created the situation in the in the first place. So, can you fill that in? 
So Netanyahu on October seventh already he said we are at war with yeah we are at war. Well, excuse me, Israel declared war on the Palestinians seventy five years ago. That war has been going on against Palestinians. Palestinians have been the victims of a vicious, savage, I would say, brutality for seventy five years. The the fact that the two million people are locked up in the concentration camp which some people now say has been turned into an extermination camp in the Gaza Strip is only a, is only a part of this horrific story, this savagery that Palestinians have been subjected to. Palestinians have never had an army. They still don't have an army. What we saw is a, is a small, you know, guerrilla group. It's not an army um, operating. And so Israel has been murdering civilians dispossessing people, torturing them, beating them, taking away their land, stealing from them, uh, stealing from their stealing their homes and their land and their resources and their uh, and, the, and their trees and their money and on and on and on for 75 years. Israel declared this war 75 years ago. Netanyahu thinks the war started now. This has nothing to do with Hamas. These are Palestinian fighters from the Gaza Strip in an act of resistance. Now, I, I, I don't think I'm saying anything that anybody would disagree with when I say that it's, it breaks your heart when, every, when a person gets killed. Everybody has a mother and a father. It's horrifying. It's horrifying. Of course it's horrifying when, when somebody gets killed. But what they do is they take it out of context. You cannot take this out of context. What we saw... Palestinian fighters doing, and again, we don't know the full picture because there is no there are, is no reliable news source yet that I've seen anyway uh, that gives us the entire picture: how many were taken, how many were killed, how many were injured, in what under what circumstances, and so on. Um, it does look like the decapitated babies is unfounded, by the way. Oh, it's claim. unfounded. Yeah, it's yeah. unfounded, and babies in, in chicken coops and cages yeah. are unfounded. But I mean, the thing, and let's say you know. What do you think happens when a one-ton bomb is dropped on a building? You think babies aren't decapitated? You think people aren't suffocated in the gases that come out and the smoke? The white phosphorus. And the white phosphorus and the buildings that fall on people and people get trapped and parts of their body gets... I mean, it goes on and on and on, the horror. You know what I mean? You want to get to the details of the horror? Fine, let's get into the details of the horror. Let me describe to you what happens when you drop a one-ton bomb on a, on a, on a, in a neighborhood, in a residential neighborhood. How many children get, you know, so that's not the issue. We need to see this in a political context. Now, military, you know, military operations, acts of, you know, actions have to lead to a political outcome. That's the point of what, they, that's, that's their objective. You know, people are always, you know, get stuck on the military side of it, on the, on, on the armed side of it. But the more important issue here is the political accomplishments, the political objective that is reached through the military goal. Now, Palestinians have been waiting for a peaceful resolution for decades. And their hands have been pushed, slapped away. And they've been humiliated over and over again. Every time they reach out, every time they try to, they agree to some kind of a solution, they get slapped in the face and humiliated. What, just a couple of years ago, we saw the March of Return where where, where people marched to the wall, to the gates of Gaza. And what, what did they get? They got thousands of young Palestinians whose legs had to be amputated. There are over 2,000 young Palestinians whose legs have been amputated because of sniper fire that was directed against unarmed civilians who came to protest and say, you know, we, we want peace, we want freedom, we want to return to our homes and our land peacefully. So when something like this happens now, so they say, okay, fine, all this peaceful, uh, nonviolent stuff is great, but it's not working. Number one, and look at the and look at the results. Look at as innocent, how many innocent civilians were killed. And this is only one example. The March of Return is one example. There's so many others. So now where medics this. medics were targeted. Yes. Uh, members of the press were targeted yes. by snipers who are very good at their jobs. This yeah. wasn't an accident. Yeah. No, none of this was an accident. And there were no military. There was no military there. Everybody was a civilian. I mean, there is no, like I said, there's no such thing as a Palestinian military. There never has been. They're all civilians. Some are policemen, maybe. 
And now you've got this military operation that, you know, I was listening to this one retired Israeli general. He couldn't stop praising the military, the, the you know, what, a, what an incredible military operation the, the Palestinians put together and executed. He was on and on and on and on talking about how, what, and it was. And look what they've accomplished. They have completely disrupted the state of Israel. They have completely disrupted. From a military point of view, this operation was a massive success. Are people suffering? Yes. Are people dead? Yes. Are innocent people uh, hurt and injured and killed? Yes. But it's not the only thing that exists. There's a whole other story to it. There's two million people who are being murdered on a regular basis by the thousands on a regular basis. They don't have access to water or electricity or, or you know, a child with a, people with curable diseases dying because Israel won't give them access to hospitals that are, you know, a 20-minute drive from Gaza. So that's the whole story. So now look what they've done. A handful of well-trained fighters. Look what they did. They disrupted the entire country. Tel Aviv airport is chaos, complete chaos. Flights don't want to, you know, uh, the foreign airlines don't want to land because the, the rockets are, fi are falling too close. Most of the Israeli airline pilots are also fighter pilots. So they've been, they've been called in. The airport is chaos. So militarily, this is a, this is a huge accomplishment. This is a huge victory. And they're still fighting. All these days later, they're still fighting. They still, this massive Israeli army has not been able to stop them. Now, on top of all that, we know that negotiations are, are forthcoming because these things always end with negotiations. Right. Even though they're saying, right? They're saying no, they're they not going say. to negotiate. They always say that. Right. But eventually they have to negotiate. So, so there's now, a... I'm yeah, sorry, keep go going. Ahead. No, no, keep I'm, going. I'm just saying, so now the big question is, how, do, how, how is this military operation, which was very successful, going to be translated into a real political gain for Palestinians? That's what's going to be the real test. Right. So I want to play, we have a clip of Netanyahu, Netanyahu um, uh, making a statement. Then uh, let's, let's show that. It has subtitles. <laughs> Wait, let's rewind it. Sorry, so. את כל המקומות שהחמאס נערך בהם, של עיר הרשע הזאת, כל המקומות שהחמאס מסתתר בהם, פועל מתוכם, נהפוך אותם לאיי חורבות. אני אומר לתושבי עזה, צאו משם עכשיו, כי אנחנו נפעל בכל מקום ובכל העוצמה. So what is he saying there? I heard, is he saying leave Gaza? <laughs> yeah. Is he telling the people of Gaza to leave Gaza? Okay, so he's saying several things here, and I think they're worth noting. Uh, yes, at the end he says, the people of Gaza, you should leave. Well, where are they going to go? They don't have bomb shelters and they can't leave. Israel is the reason they can't leave. So, you know, it's nonsense. And then he says, all these places from which Hamas is operating will become, will be ruins, turn into right, ruins. Turn well, to rubble. first of all, if you know where they are and you know they're operating, why didn't you do it before the attack? Mm. Why are you acting now? Why are you closing the stable after the horses have escaped? What's the point of destroying them now? You know what I'm saying? So he's he's trying to defend himself by saying, yes, we'll, what, do you mean? What, what do you mean respond? Your job was to prevent this. Israeli citizens were expecting you to prevent this so this wouldn't happen to them. I'm not talking about justice, no justice, who's right, who's wrong now. I'm just talking from an Israeli citizen right. perspective. The job. Your yeah. job was to defend Israelis. You failed. Now you're going to bomb Gaza? You haven't even gotten control of the cities and, and the towns of the kibbutzim that have been taken by these Palestinian fighters, and you're going to bomb every place that they operate from and every hiding place? What the hell are you talking about? You don't even know where they're hiding. Most of their operations are underground anywhere, in tunnels anyway. And they're very well, you know, very well uh, fortified. So that's what you do. I mean, it's, you know, it's complete nonsense. And where are these people going to go? You know? But this is his this is his, his his mode of operation, and he's very successful at it. People buy it. People buy it and and, and love it, and they can't get enough of it. Yeah, someone uh, said that. Um, someone said to me uh, that they are uh, Hamas is not letting Palestinians leave into Israel, even though Israel is accepting them. That's complete nonsense. Yeah. How are they going to leave? How are they going to get there? They're going to walk with their children and their bags, and Israel's going to let them in. And where are they going to go in Israel? To do what? Sit on the street? Hitchhike? What exactly? Take a bus? 
<laughs> what exactly are they going to do? You know, it's complete nonsense. Yeah. And the, and you know the the gate the the fence is now broken. I mean, it's it was you know just barbed wire. It was easy easily, but it's you know it's a lot of it's miles to walk. Yeah. Um, let's let's also show a video uh, that Netanyahu himself tweeted, and uh, his tweet that accompanied this image said, "Continue with all the strength." So there, he tweets out a building being bombed. And then let's show uh, a video from the defense minister. Yeah. Yeah. So he's saying that we're going to cut them off totally. We are dealing with human animals and we'll act accordingly. And some people see this and say, yeah, but he's talking about Hamas, not the people of Gaza, except the punishment he's inflicting is collective. <laughs> yeah, this whole idea that somehow Hamas is the problem is, is you know, it's 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 a... It's the it's the it's the terminology thing, you know. They never say Gazans or Palestinians. They say the the Hamas, the Hamas, and it's always uh, masculine singular, the Hamas. This has got nothing to do with Hamas. I mean, you know, these are Palestinian fighters, and if they weren't Hamas, you think they wouldn't be fighting, you know? Um, so it's it's nonsense. It's it's you know, it's Tony Soprano. It's a gangster who's been who's been injured humiliated and now is out there to get vengeance that's really what we saw that is the face of a gangster who was humiliated and just is just full of rage and wants to kill as many people as possible out of out of vengeance and that's what he's doing and he's got the ability to do so and look at his face you can see by his face that he's just so angry and humiliated uh, that's that's really what it is and that's how israel is behaving israel is behaving like a mafia like a like a bunch of gangsters that's exactly what they are they steal they kill they uh, blackmail, and that's how they survive in the world. Um, I thought we could watch Biden's response. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, okay. thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye, Miko. Talk soon. Bye. Great. Bye. Okay. That was amazing. And I'm really excited to bring on our next guest.